Uh, good morning. It is great to see you and thank you so much um, for the availability. It was excellent last week being able to communicate and connect with another church. And meanwhile, we had John here and he, I heard great things about his sermon last week. So thank you for encouraging him. But as a result of that, we were able to then connect our church with another church. We were able to um, build relationships and bridges. And, and that's all. It's having an impact on the community so that when they drive by, when they drive by this church, they go, hey, there's some good people at this church. And when we drive by there, we'll see some things. I want to share with you some um, great things that are going on inside of this church and the lives. You know, God has provided some amazing ways. He, he's provided resources for a member of the church that just been looking and waiting. And, and, all, and finally it came through and that gave them just a little bit of breathing room that they've needed to accomplish their goals. God provided protection for a friend of a friend who, who was in a serious accident and he's not and there was no spinal damage or anything like that. God worked and, and took care of him. God gave, um, last week when I preached, at the end of the sermon, there, a guy came up and he rededicated his life. He, he said, yes, I, I need Jesus in my life again. So that was great. And God has provided hope to those people who have been going through tremendous suffering. The last month or so has been very hard on some members as they've walked through the valley. And the valley has been difficult. It's been hard. And yet God has provided peace in the midst of that. So God is doing some great things. And just continue to pray for one another, continue to pray for the church, not just um, relationally. Pray as Trevon just prayed that we would be an impact on the community. And, and part of the impact on the community is we make sure the facilities look good. And so we used to have a, a cracked old parking lot. We used to have dead grass and stuff. And God has provided great things for us already. The parking lot looks excellent. The grass, you go out there, the kids look, you know, they can play in the green grass instead of the old dusty dirt. That's excellent. The fellowship hall is looking great. Um, and we're just praying and, and continue to pray that God. God would provide for the roof, the rainy season, what, two weeks in February? <laughs> it's coming, right? It will rain, and when it rains, we need to make sure that we don't have a lot of buckets inside the sanctuary, okay? So pray that God would provide for those resources above and beyond anything that we could do, and just let's watch God work miraculously taking care of the building, and this is all a testimony of God's faithfulness to us, and then taking care of the building and taking care of us meeting and connecting with those people who are outside of the building, all right? So God's doing some great things. I want to share with you um, today from 1 Kings chapter 2, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open it up to 1 Kings chapter 2. You're going to um, want to carry these words along with you as you go, and I was thinking about these words. This is David's last words to his son, Solomon, and it, it, this message is for three kinds of people here. They're, they're, this message is for those of you who, you know, you're in the red zone. And if you don't know what the red zone is in football, the red zone is the last 20 yards before the end zone. It is the last time, and, and they really do plays differently and stuff. As they get to the red zone, they go, oh, we're really close. We can make a touchdown. We can, we can score. And for us, that's a, a picture of, you know, you've lived a good life or you lived a challenging life, but you know that, you know that you're kind of in the red zone of life. You're, you're, you're in the finishing section of life. And, and these are good words for you because I want you to think through what legacy you're passing on to those who follow. To the, the next generation, who, what, what are the words that you're going to say? To those people who follow in your path, those people who know you intimately, how are you going to communicate to them? But then you say, Pastor Paul, I'm not in the red zone of life. You know, I, I've got a lot of life left in front of me. I'm not there. I'm not, I'm not 60, 70, 80 years old. I, I'm, I'm in my early part of life. This message is also for you. Because the message is from David, but it's to his son Solomon. And so will you be willing to listen? Will you be willing to listen to the words that David has to say to you? He's passing these words along to you, the generation that is not in the red zone, the generation of people that still have a potential lot of life to live. You still have, you still have a long way to go, and, and David's going to give us some pointers, some, some things to look for in the next section of life as you continue. And then there are those of you, because you don't know, the one thing is you don't know when you're going to get to the red zone. You don't know. You know, you don't know that God's not going to call an audible. An audible is where the quarterback comes up and he sees the defense in a different strategy than the play, and he changes the play online. You don't know that God's not going to call you to go deep and get in the end zone tomorrow. You're not promised tomorrow. You're not. And so you don't know what your life is going to be like tomorrow. All you have is the promise of today, the promise of this moment. So think about this as you listen to David's words. Where are you? 
And then there's a third group of people this message is to. You got the people, everybody, you're on the field. But there's a host of people that are in the stadiums that are just kind of watching the game. They've been called, they've been asked to play. They've, they've been challenged to come out of the stadium and come onto the grass and let's play the field. But yet they refuse to. You've heard and you know what the game is like, you know where you're at, and yet you refuse to leave the stadium and come and play. You know, I was thinking about the analogy sticking with football. At the end of the football season, they have the championship, the Super Bowl championship. And then at the end of the year, they give out rings to everybody who won the Super Bowl. They give away rings to the players and to the support staff of the Super Bowl. And I've held a, a championship ring before, and those things are heavy and they're big. And those are for people who were supportive of the team. They were on the field, but they were connected to it. But if you're in the stands, you know what you get to do? You don't get a ring. You don't get a prize. All you get to do is say, well done, players. And then you got nothing to show, nothing to live for, nothing to show that you participated in the game when you go through the red zone and into the end zone. So it's for three groups of people. I want to challenge those people who are sitting in the stands to get out of the stands and come to the grass. I want to challenge those people who are young to listen to the wise words of David. And I want to challenge you who are in the red zone to think about what you're going to tell those who follow you. What are you going to tell the next generation? See, this is the thing, David, even though you've messed up, even though your life isn't exemplary, even though there are times in your life that you have really not lived your life worthy of the calling that you have received, you've messed up. You can still pass along good words to those who follow. I have seen so many people believe that they're disqualified because they've messed up. They're disqualified because, because they've done some things wrong. And, and they, who are they to tell this next generation how they should live or, or what they should live and, and how they should act? Because they themselves have lived a life that isn't exemplary. And so they have stopped encouraging the next generation. Well, David is an excellent example of somebody who messed up and still passes along wisdom to the next generation. And that's what we're going to look at. Let's look at the passage, starting in verse 1, and then we'll pick it up in the complexity of David's life. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. When the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. So David's life was complex, to say the least, right? We've studied it. We've looked at his relationships. Uh, would you not agree that David's life has been pretty complex? There, there, there's times in which David's faith is incredibly famous, incredibly famous. Remember when we looked at David's victory over Goliath? Remember when, when we said, who is this ruddy guy? He comes out, he comes to give his brothers some food, his brothers support them while they're there, and Goliath is on the other side of the valley, and, and he's taunting them. And remember that? And David, David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the army of the living God? And, and then so Saul says, well, you can have my armor to go face him. He goes, I don't need armor. I, I got the faith of the living God. See, see, God has rescued me from the bear. God has rescued me from the lion. I'm okay. I'm okay with, with the faith of God. I'll go take care of that Goliath guy. And so David runs out there and David says, you come at me with sword, spear, and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. Amen, David. Way to have faith. Excellent. And we have all used that. Oh man, this is a Goliath. This is something that takes tremendous faith. And we follow David's examples being a, being a person of just tremendous faith. And then David, David, another exemplary thing is he befriends Jonathan. Kings, Saul, son, they become best buds, they become BFFs. They're really tight. And so David befriends him and they, they make this covenant of friendship together. Oh, it's excellent. And Jonathan doesn't believe that his dad wants to kill David, but pretty soon Jonathan's convinced and they separate and Jonathan says this as they separate, the Lord is witness between you and me, between your descendants and my descendants forever, Jonathan says. And then later on in a horrible battle, the Philistines come, they take the Ark of the Covenant, they kill Saul, and they kill Jonathan. And then, then David unites, ultimately the battle happens, and David ends up uniting all the tribes of Israel, he becomes king. And then he looks out and he says, is there any kindness I can show to Jonathan's family? And then, John, and then David, because of his covenant with Jonathan, he calls Mephibosheth in. And he says, Mephibosheth, I'm going to bless you. And you can always eat at my table. And so you can hear the echo of the crutches, click, 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 as they come to the king's table every day for dinner. 
See, Jonathan befriend, David befriended Jonathan. What a blessing and what a model that is for us to follow. And then there's the Davidic covenant. And David is, David is in his palace, cedar palace. It's lined, it's beautiful, it's, it's, it's awesome. And David is there and, and David looks out and he sees the, the tent of God. And he's going, why am I in such a beautiful place? And God, he's in, it. He's in an old tent. And, and I'm gonna, I, 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 we need to build a temple for God. We need to do something amazing because he is so great. We need to build this great tab, temple. And he tells Nathan, Nathan says, hey, do what you want to do. And then God says, no, no, no. I'm not about gold and I'm not about bricks. And so I want you to tell David a different message. And so Nathan comes in to David and Nathan says, David, you know what? You're not going to build me a temple. You're not going to build God a temple. But God is going to do something amazing through you. God is going to promise you that you will have a son forever on the throne. You will have a son forever. Oh, that is fantastic. It's called the Davidic covenant. It's a promise that, that ultimately leads, generations after generation, leads to, to the birth of Jesus. Leads to Jesus Christ being the Savior of us. Oh, fantastic. David's life is filled with these great promises of faith. And I'm sure that your life... If I were to ask you, has God ever worked a miracle in your life? Has God ever done anything wonderful in your life? Has God ever answered a prayer in your life? That you go, that had to be God. All of us would raise our hands and go, yeah, yeah, God's done that. You've got these testimonies of faith. You've got these things that you would proudly come up here and say, let me tell you the story of how God did this. Let me tell you the story of, of when God did this. Let me tell you. I'm sure you would all raise your hands and say, let's do it. But life is complicated and David's life is complicated. See, David just didn't have things of faith, but he had things of failure, too. He had great failures. The first most famous failure that he had was adultery and then murder moment. He was out. Instead of looking over here at the ark and the tent of God, he was looking over here at this gal who was bathing naked, and he got fixated, and he commits adultery with Bathsheba. And she tells David, I'm pregnant, and so to cover up the pregnancy, to cover up the adulterous relationship, he tries to get Bathsheba's husband to come in and have relations with his wife, and Uriah the Hittite is, is a noble man, he's a righteous man, and he refuses to do that. And Uriah just isn't some ordinary guy. If you go to the end of 2 Samuel, you go to the very last book, has a list of David's 30 fighting men. He was one of the top 30 warriors in David's army. And you look at all, all that list and you see these name after name after name. You go to the very last name and you see Uriah the Hittite was one of David's fine fighting men. And David continues to want to cover it up. And so David sends a letter, ultimately has Uriah murdered. And then Nathaniel, then God has to come up and God has to confront David for the murder. And so it's a great big failure in David's life. But the thing is, David confesses when Nathan confronts him, David confesses. And David says, I have sinned against the Lord. Listen carefully to what he says. I have sinned against the Lord. All right? Because he does something that he considers worse than Bathsheba and Uriah. That's the next sin. It's David's fabulous sin. It's not just his famous sin. This is his fabulous sin. This is the sin that, that costs tons of lives that he does. He gets wrapped up in the pride. He gets wrapped up. He goes, I want to know at the big pinnacle of his kingdom. He wa I want to know how many warriors and chariots do I have. Job, go find out. And Job, no, no, don't do this, David. Don't. No, go find out how many men I have. Well, I want to know how big my army is. See, David was he wanted to have confidence in army more than he wanted to have confidence in God. He wanted to trust in chariots more than he wanted to trust in his creator. He, he, he just said, oh, I want to know how big and powerful and strong I am. It took Job nine months. And then he came back with a report. And David says, I have sinned greatly against the Lord. I have sinned greatly. The result of David's confession, the result of this sin, is that God gives him three options. Another prophet comes up to David and says, David, because of what you've done, because of what you've done, you get to choose door number one, door number two, or door number three. You ready? Door number one, three years of famine in the land. Door number two, three months of you fleeing from your enemies. And door number three, three days of plague against the land. 
David doesn't want any of that. David, David sinned, and, and because he sinned, somebody is going to pay the price. David picks door number three, and the angel of death kills 70,000 people in one day. And God holds back that. See, David sinned. He had sinned greatly. He failed greatly. He's known for his sin against Bathsheba, but it's a sin of pride. It's a sin of arrogance that was really costly to the kingdom. Oh, David's confession. Number three, David's other failure is his failure as a father. His failure as a father. His son, Amnon, get, get, gets all hot and bothered over his sister Tamar and he ends up raping his sister Tamar. And, and Tamar just expresses great grief. It's a horrible situation. We looked at that in depth a couple of weeks ago. And what does David do to Amnon? doesn't do anything. So Absalom decides to take it into his own hands. His other son decides to do it. And his other, other son, Absalom, kills, ultimately kills Amnon. And then Absalom decides, so, you know, David's not a fit to be king. And so you should call me king. You should, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of judging you. And so Amnon begins this rebellion. And David never addresses it. David just pushes it off, ignores it. Well, I'll invite, finally I'll invite Absalom into the palace, but I'll never talk to him. And so David does a horrible job as a father. Amnon ends up, ends up leading a revolt against the kingdom. David ends up fleeing the kingdom, fleeing the palace. Absalom ends up dying, getting speared as his hair got caught in the forest. And David as a father example is not a good one for us to follow. David's failure as a father is, is famous. See, victory and failure in his personal life. If I were to ask you the same thing, would I say that there are some victories in your personal life? Probably. Or there's some failures in your personal life? Probably. Victory and failure in your public life. Have you ever done anything publicly that you're just really ashamed of? And, or other things that you're just really proud of? Victory and failure in your family life. How's your family? Are there things that you're proud of and things that you wish you could have done differently? See, you see sometimes when, when we look at that, we, we think we can only talk about those things that we've done fabulous. David is a great example for us. You can still pass along words of wisdom even though you have public failure, private failure, and family failure. You can still pass along words of wisdom, and that's exactly what David does. Don't let your failures prevent you from passing along wisdom to the next generation. Do not defer yourself from passing along wisdom to the next generation. Next generation, do not allow somebody's failures to prevent you from listening to them in their wisdom. So kids... Just because your parents have messed up doesn't mean that they still don't have insight that they can share with you. Don't, don't write them off completely because, because, well, I know my dad and, and he's done this and, and now anything he says, I'm not going to pay any attention to. Does he walk with God? Does he try? So to those who are not in the last 20 yards, you know, make sure you can listen today. To those who are watching, to those who are paying attention, whether it's now or next week, Hey, watch, listen to what David has to say. So, 1 Kings chapter 2, David's final words to Prince Solomon. And I'm only going to read the first four verses. It says this, As the time of King David's death approached, he gave this challenge to his son Solomon. I'm going where everyone on earth must someday go. Take courage and be a man. Observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow all his ways. Keep the decrees, commands, regulations, and laws written in the law of Moses so that you will be successful in all you do wherever you go. If you do this, then the Lord will keep the promise he made to me. He told me, if your descendants live as they should and follow me faithfully with all of their heart and soul, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. In these verses, there are five lessons for us to learn. In these verses, there are five truths for us to be aware of. And so for you in the, in the final 20, and kind of in the, in the last 20 yards, you're in the red zone. You ready? Because these are things you need to think about passing on to the next generation. 
For those of you who are, in, who are not in the red zone, for those of you who are in the middle of the playing field, be ready because God is going to say something to you. As God said something to Solomon through David. First, live a life of faith. Live a life of faith. What's he say? He says, observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow his ways. Live your life of faith. Did you see that? Did you observe that? Observe the requirements of the Lord your God. Uh, uh, to observe is not, just not to look at and glance so you don't open up the Bible and say, well, that was a good story. Close it. But stop for a minute in your reading. Pay attention. What is God saying? Uh, uh, and look at that and, and meditate on it and focus on it and say, God, what are you saying in your word? What are you saying to me on a Sunday morning? What are you saying to me in a Bible study? I want to observe your requirements. I want, I want to take time to make observations. I want to take time to list what is the text saying? How is it applied to me? You, you, you take your time and you observe the passage, observe the requirements of the law. You know, the Old Testament isn't sit there so that, so that your book looks impressive. It's there for you to read. The stories are in the Old Testament are there to teach and to train us and to equip us for righteousness. So take some of those stories and read them and observe. And then the other one says, follow. You, you make these observations, you go, great, those are great observations, but then you need to apply it. You need to apply the text. You just don't listen to the text, just don't read the text and go, great, those are excellent observations. What is it telling you to do? What is the passage actually? Ask God for insight. God, help me understand how to apply this passage to my life. Help me understand how I can be a better person. Help me understand how I can highlight you, how I can live a life worthy of the calling that you have called me to. Help me, Lord, observe the passage in such a way that my life is changed by it. And so throughout these five points, as David was talking to Solomon, I'm going to pull up some of Solomon's words written in the book of Proverbs. I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to echo David's words as translated through the life of Solomon. And so here's the first one. Solomon, Proverbs 1, 9. Fear of the Lord is a foundation of truth, of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. See, if you don't observe the passage, if you sit here and you and hang out on the passage, you could be considered a fool. Coming in and hearing the word of God and then leaving and not letting it make any impact so that you cannot follow. You, you just kind of come and that's it. You don't follow. You hear and then you leave and you never apply. The fear of the Lord is a foundation of true knowledge. It starts with this understanding who God is. That is the beginning of true knowledge. You have to know and understand. We're going to celebrate the table. We're going to take communion. And we're going to celebrate the fact that Jesus, Jesus lived for us. He gave his life for us. He wants us to celebrate the fact that he was here. He gave his life. He died for us so that we could live for him. The fear of the Lord is the foundation of knowledge, of true knowledge. But fools despise Fools hate. Fools ignore wisdom and discipline. Point number two, live a life of obedience. First, you live a life of faith. Okay, I've got the faith, but now what's the faith? The faith tells me a way to follow. And now, now you're stuck. You've got to actually follow. If he says, do this, it means, you know what? You got to do it. If he says, don't do this, you know what? It means you don't do it. You need to follow. Live a life of obedience. Keep, keep, keep the decrees, commands, regulations, and laws of Moses. You know, you, you, you keep something that you find is valuable, right? You find, you have something of value and you keep it. Some of you probably have some things in your house that you got from your parents or maybe your grandparents, right? You, you've kept them. Why? Because they're of great value. And, and you keep that which is of value and you discard things that aren't of value. And so, so sometimes you have some things that are of value. You have, maybe you have some things that are of value. You got, a, you got some money and you go, I'm going to keep this or am I just going to discard this money and throw it away? Yeah, some of you got to want to know, huh? Am I going to discard that, right? Because it, does it have any value to you anymore? Am I going to keep it or am I going to discard it? Same is true with God's laws. You hear God's laws. Is it going to be of value to it? Are you going to say that is valuable to me? Or are you going to say, ah, that's just for them back there. 
I don't need to apply it today. Proverbs 19, 16 says, Keep the commandments and keep your life. Despising them leads to death. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a word. I'm going to change a word. Ignoring them. Just, you know, not paying any attention to them. Despising them, hating them. You know, God's word is such that, that it, the commandments are like guardrails. You ever gone down the road? Have you noticed where guardrails are on a road? You guys know that. Uh, Tony Garcia used to work on them all the time. Guardrails are, are close to corners on a road. They're close to a place where if you're going down the straightaway, you don't need a guardrail. But if there's a bend in the road, you'll notice there's a guardrail. What's it for? It's to keep you on the road. It, it's, to, it's to keep you from flying off the cliff. It's to keep you from, from going into the danger zone. That's what the command's for. That's what the rules are for. That's what the regulations are for. So we need to be faithful to stay between the guardrails. Stay between the guardrails. Live in the lane that God has given you to live and stay within the guardrails. Don't look at somebody else's lane way over there and go, I'm going to go over there. They've got a journey that they've got to make. You stay within the guardrails that God has given you. Be faithful. Be faithful to God's commands, laws, rules, and regulations. Number three, live in constant awareness of the Lord's reward. Right? right? And so, so we need to live in constant awareness. We don't think about this much. We don't, but we should. We don't think about this a lot, but we should. This should be kind of our motivation. This should be something that we go, oh, yeah, hey, there's a reward on the end of it. There's a reward, and, and our reward is Jesus at the end of our life. That's what we get. And if you're not satisfied with that, if you think I want a mansion instead of Jesus, you're, you, 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 are, you, you, you don't have it right. You get Jesus. In two weeks, I'm going to do a wedding. In two weeks, I'm going to do a perform my cousin's wedding. When I go to that wedding, you know what? The bride's going to walk down. Is the bride going to walk down and go, you know, I get a great apartment with him. Is that what she's going to think about? Is she going to think, wow, you know, I, I, get, I, get, I get part of his car. This is great. Is she going to think, hey, hey, look, 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 I get his father as a relative, right? How many of you are going, yes, I get those in-laws as relatives, right? right? That's what you're exactly looking for, right? That's not what the bride walks down to get, is it? The bride walks down the aisle, and what is the bride looking for? Oh, man, I get to be married to him. And what does he look at? Oh, man, she's going to be married to me. And, and think about that with God, right? You're the bride of Christ. What, what are we looking for? The great marriage feast. And what is the great marriage feast? When we get to look him in the eye. And so we got him. We've got him, man. And so you need to live, live always, church, church, with him in mind. Live for the prize. The Apostle Paul says, run in such a way as to get the prize. Run. And get exhausted. He says this, run. Wait, he says, I make my body my slave so that I may not be disqualified. Right? Uh, I don't want to be a bride coming down the aisle wearing junky clothes. I don't want to be a bride coming down and, and everybody turns and looks and goes, what is she thinking? She's unprepared she, and she's disqualified for being a bride. She's not even supposed to be here, right? That's just, that's just so disrespectful, her wearing that. Oh, and yet some of you are wanting to put that on to meet Jesus. Paul says, I press towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Press on, run. Did you notice that it, it's hard work? Did you notice that, that it takes energy? Did you notice it takes stamina? Oh, church, church, run in constant awareness of the Lord's reward. Think about it. This is not an easy task. This is not a task for the faint-hearted. This is not a task for the wimpy. Don't wimp out. Don't give up. Press on and press in, church. We are here together. That's number three. David's charge to Solomon. Are you listening? Church, young people, are you paying attention? For some of the young people here, you're at the 10-yard line. You've got a lot of life in front of you. Are you paying attention? Are you going to live within the commands? For some of you, you're, you're thinking, okay, I've got to remember these things because I'm at the 80-yard line. I'm in the red zone. And, and I need to remember this so I can pass this on. Yeah, I've had some great failures. Yeah, I've had some great success, but I'm going to pass these truths on. Notice David isn't talking about himself at all. David is only talking about God. 
as his testimony to God. Number Proverbs says this, Trouble chases sinners, while blessing rewards the righteous. Number four, live for God's kingdom. In view of the reward, but live today for God's kingdom. If you do this, then the Lord will keep his promise that he made to me. That, that you're going to have a king forever on the throne. We know this. We know that, that once we have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, we are a king's kid. He has adopted us, right? So, so if this is a now and not yet thing. We are king's kids today, church. You are adopted by the king of kings, Lord of lords. He is that. And, and his kingdom is here because it lives in us, and yet his kingdom will come soon. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is now in heaven, church. Live for God's kingdom. Live in light of that. What does a king's kid do? Live your life for something bigger than yourself. Don't ever, ever settle just to live your life for yourself. Young people, life is bigger Life has greater purpose. God has a great call for you. Live your life to reflect the kingdom's value. So what kingdom structures your life today? What kingdom structures your life today? The world's kingdom says this. It says that, you know, we all came from a glob of glue, glob of goo out of the, out of the primordial soup. And it really is telling you this. You are no imp more important than a zebra or an antelope. You, you are not any more important because we all came from the same primordial soup. Therefore, we're all equal, the zebra and the antelope. Get it? Z to A, you got it? I think you're tracking, right? Okay. So that, that's what it says. You are you're no greater than that. God, he took us out of the dust, right? So of course we have dust-like qualities in us. Whew. He breathed his spirit into us. He breathed his spirit, and we are created in the image of God. Male and female, he created them. We are created. The world says that there is no objective truth. The world says that if it feels good, do it. The world says you should demand your rights. I got my rights. I need to demand my rights. The Bible teaches us that we need to die to ourselves. We need to die to ourselves. We need to give all of our energy for him, not for us. It says, my stuff is his stuff. And therefore, it doesn't own, it doesn't possess me. So church, what kingdom structures your life? Is it kingdom of the world? Are you living to please the pleasures and the priorities of the world? Or is your kingdom Christ? You've got to make a decision. You've got to figure it out because you're, you're a king's kid. If you have accepted Jesus Christ, then why are you living for the kingdom of Satan? Why are you living for somebody else's kingdom? Live for the kingdom of who rules and reigns in your heart. Live for him. Do you rule for the kingdom of the flesh? The desires of the flesh that, that come along and persuade you and tempt you and pretty soon you walk away and once again you're confessing in front of God, God forgive me for, for I have failed once more. God, I have sinned greatly because you gave into the kingdom of the flesh. Or are you living for the kingdom of the spirit? Kingdom of the spirit is really hard to live by. Kingdom of the spirit tells you to love your neighbor as yourself. It tells you to pray for your enemies. It tells you to joyfully, in the midst of trial, testify and depend upon who God is. Oh, your king's kid. For those of you who are in the, the red zone, remember how God has worked with you. You know what? And testify to those in the next generation about what's next. Watch how you live. You've got to watch, you've got to observe how you live. David says to Solomon, if your descendants watch how they live, if they watch how they live, it, it, it's like observing your life. And at the end of your life, I want you at the end of tonight, when you go to bed and your head is on the pillow, I want you to think back. I want you to start this practice. Every night, think about, where did God bless me today? 
I want you to think of, of three blessings that God blessed you with today. Maybe you think, okay, uh, praise the Lord, I have air conditioning that works. Right? right? Woo I got air conditioning that works on this hot day, right? Uh, I got, I, I, in other words, you can feel the heat. Your body works. That's fantastic. Uh, maybe you have people in your house that you love and you go, thank you, God, for a good relationship with those I love. Thank you, God, for the ability to interact and share a smile or a prayer request with the checker that I was at. Thank you, Lord, for the ability to connect with this person today. Thank you, Lord, for using me today and that purpose on that phone call. I don't know. Watch how you live. Every night, go to bed and think about the blessings of the day. And then, then you wake up, you go, okay, God, I'm ready. I'm ready. Use me today and remind me of how you worked. And you're going to find God working in your life in ways that you have never thought because you're observing God throughout your day. You're observing how he works. And then you can teach and train the next generation. So walk faithfully with the Lord, with your heart and your spirit. If your descendants watch how they live, if they walk faithfully before me with all of their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne. Church, give God all of your heart. Give God all of your spirit. Uh, uh, say, today, Lord, I, I give you it all. And then at the end of the night, say, God, I'm sorry because I took it away from you. Uh, I took the joy you gave me and I put in stress and anxiety. I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. And then just learn how God is talking to you and walking with you. Number five, live decisively. Eliminate evil and reward the good. And so verses five through nine, David tells a couple of stories. He, he tells a story about this guy who, who betrayed him and this guy who, who thought he, he lied to David. And he said, oh, I killed those guys because it was an act of war. And David says, no, it stained his belt and stained his feet. He killed him because he wanted to. He says, Solomon, take care of him. And it says, Solomon, this guy was really good to me. Bless this guy. Make sure he does okay. So Solomon, I want you to live a life being eliminating evil and rewarding good. Eliminating evil and rewarding good. Listen to what Solomon has to say about this. Solomon says, don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Solomon says, don't do as the wicked do. Don't follow in the path of evildoers. Solomon says, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate, and he lists what evil is. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. And we allow that stuff to penetrate our social media posts. We befriend people who speak arrogantly and, and evilly. And, and we, we pride ourselves in how many followers we have. And the followers, sometimes, what about the movies that you watch? What about the songs you listen to? Uh, and there are some songs out there. You hear them. People are coming and you hear this horrible music. And you go, wow, they're filling their life with this hateful music. The Lord, fear the Lord is to hate evil. Don't ever grow comfortable with evil, church. Whether it's evil in a movie that you're, you're watching, whether it's evil in a video game you're playing, whether it's evil in a music that you listen to, or the news that you pay attention to, don't ever, ever grow comfortable in saying that's just okay, because that's just them. Proverbs 20, 28 unfailing love and faithfulness protect the king his throne is made secure through love his throne is made secure through love love the greatest commandment is to love the lord your god with all your heart mind soul and strength the second greatest commandment is to love one another as you love yourself love five things that david told solomon his son. Live a life of faith. Live a life of obedience. Live in constant awareness of the Lord's reward. Live for God's kingdom and live and live decisively. I'm going to have you make a decision. Are you going to follow God today? 
Are you going to follow God? You're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised that, that you're not going to be called into the end zone and God's not going to throw a long pass and, and, and all of a sudden, before you know it, you're standing in front of God because you don't know what happened. You're not promised tomorrow. You are promised Jesus Christ today. You are promised the opportunity to accept him. You are promised the opportunity to be filled with his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. So don't stand in the stadiums and just applaud the players. God is calling you to the field. God is asking you to take the ball. God is telling you we've got a goal to get. We've got a kingdom to accomplish. We've got people, souls to win. We've got friends to make. We've got love to press on and press into. Church, pick up the ball and let's run. Let's get out of the stands. Let's get onto the field. And God will equip you. He will put the right linemen in front of you. He will open the path for you to be blessed. Because the goal is Christ Jesus. The goal is the bride and the groom coming together in that great ceremony. And Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, and he takes the cup and he says, until we meet again, Thank you very much for watching. There are just a couple of steps that we want you to take. And if you have your phone with you, just scan the QR code. Or if you're watching on your phone, simply tap on the link. The link will take you to a couple of things. One, a place to donate. It's always important that we're faithful in giving back to God. If he has blessed us, we're blessed to be a blessing. So we would ask you to give generously to the church. Two, to connect with us. Let us know who you are. Let us know who you are. And three, how to pray for you. We love to pray for you, and so we, uh, I can testify I've seen God work miracles, and so we'd love to see and join in prayer for you. Also, we'd love for you to come and visit, so just make way and come on a Sunday morning and visit. That way you get to see the live version of it instead of the live stream version of it. And if you have any questions, feel free to text those as well. But make sure that you subscribe. That becomes important to us, and make sure that you also like this video. The more people that like the video, the more people it will reach. So thank you very much for watching and have a blessed day.